Hello class, welcome to your lecture on Celtic myth, Queen Med in the Tain, and sacred kingship in Ireland. I noticed that quite a few students seemed excited for this unit on Celtic myth, given their own Irish heritage. I as well, I'm an Irish national. DNA tests reveal 48% Northern Irish, my mother having been born in County Cork and raised in Dublin. So I've set the LED lights to green and put on my Dublin Tweed. This unit will also be designed as a general introduction to Celtic mythology, both in the continent and in the British Isles in Ireland. This is an immense field of study, so we're going to start with something a little bit more entertaining. A few housekeeping items in our evolving narrative of world mythology. At this point in the course, we are between the onset of the post-axial period and the modern period, so it might be customary in a world myth class like ours to study the Anglo-Saxon Beowulf, or the Norse Eddas, or the Arthurian Sagas, or the German Nibelungslied, or the Scandinavian Kalevala, and many others. Uh, we're going to be focusing on Celtic and Irish myth instead, although we will cover a bit of the Arthurian material next week. Muskehill begins by pointing out that the word Irish is seldom coupled with the word civilization. The Irish have been considered by British imperialists to be the model savages, white chimpanzees, saith Kingsley, who practice clannish broils and coarse idolatry. That was the British Prime Minister Disraeli. And yet, according to Cahill, the Irish preserved important elements of ancient Roman culture and Celtic myth, while fusing them to Catholic Christianity in a way that was both unique and fascinating. Before diving into Cahill, a little background on the Celts. The term Celt traces back to the Greek Keltoi and implies hidden, a hidden people from the view of the more civilized at least, or so it seemed to the Greeks and Romans. Only around 1700 CE did scholars begin to study the Celtic family of languages, which include Irish, Scottish Gaelic, Manx, Welsh, Cornish, and Breton. The Greeks used the term for the ancient Gaulish peoples, the Gauls, who are ancestors of the French. During the Hellenistic period, Gaulish peoples invaded Thrace and Asia Minor and became the Galatians, to whom St. Paul wrote an epistle. Archaic Celtic is thought to be the root language of all the above, and despite the paucity of sources, is reconstructed by Indo-European linguists as one of the most ancient and widespread European languages, like Slavic, Germanic, Romance languages, Latin, Greek, etc. Wide interest in Celtic myth was especially aroused when James Macpherson published The Poems of Ossian in 1764, which purported to be the rediscovered lost works of the Scottish Gaelic bard, but were actually forgeries. All this amounts to the fact that the Celts were a very ancient people. Comparative linguists can study Celtic, Ancient Greek, Ancient Latin, and even Sanskrit and find similar root words and elements. The semantic and mythological worldview of the Celtic language is therefore related through distant ancestry to those of many other cultures we've studied in the course. It also develops along its own unique and incomparable lines. Learn more about the most ancient Celts in some of the documentaries I've put up for the unit this week, especially the documentary The Celts, which you can watch if you have Amazon Prime. Probably the best received scholarly book on the myths and legends of the Celts is by James McKillop, and we'll be looking at a chapter of his on sacred kingship in a moment. This lecture is structured as giving us an overview of the most important uh, relevant information from the first few chapters in the introduction, before diving into First Cahill and then the more specific topic of sacred kingship. McKillop be begins his introduction to Celtic studies by noticing the nostalgic appeal. Bards, crags, mists, harps, golden tressed maidens, forgotten but recoverable magical feats, such was the Celtic world for the Romantic era. During this period, wide-eyed speculation attributed to the Druids, that is, priests of ancient Celtic religion described by Roman commentators, almost all pre-Roman monuments, including the pre-Celtic, as we now know, Stonehenge. Charlotte Brooks' reliquaries of Irish poetry established that old Irish texts, in fact, existed. For a while, however, European Celtomania was something between sobriety and moonshine. Before the mid-19th century, there hadn't even been a single archaeological dig at a major Celtic site. The earliest reference to the Celtoi we have are in Greek documents, as early as 560 to 500 BCE. First known Celts are thought to have lived north of the Alps, in the Danube Valley region, close to the river's origins in Austria, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. The Celtic goddess Danu, also known as Anna or Anu, may get her name from the Danube River. 
The Celts have been traced by archaeologists back to at least 1200 to 800 BCE. East of the Salzburg mountain range near Lake Hallstatt, archaeologists discovered a salt mine in which skeletons of 980 bodies and many artifacts were buried. The designs, geometrical, ornate, with plant and animal motifs found at Hallstatt flourished from 800 to 450 BCE throughout Celtic Europe. The Laten archaeological site it was another massive find and its people flourished from 500 to 200 BCE. These cultures persisted in some areas until the Norman conquest of Ireland. Here you see a map of many important Celtic archaeological sites, including Halstead and Laten, as well as a reconstruction of Celtic burial sites. Here are some of the finds at Halstead. The most discussed piece of physical evidence for the ancient Celts is the Gundestrup cauldron. Discovered in Denmark in a peat bog in 1880, it's fairly massive, holding 28.5 gallons. It is richly decorated or ornate with ram-headed snakes, the boar-headed war trumpet, a female deity, perhaps reminiscent of Queen Med, a tall man thought to be a war god and a horned god seated in what almost looks like a yogi's full lotus posture. This is thought to be Sernunos, lord of nature, animals, fruits, grain, and prosperity. And there's also armed infantry, a sacred tree, a spotted leopard, a chariot or a cart, and a small acolyte. Cattle on the cauldron may be distantly related to certain episodes in the Tain, which we'll look at in a moment, specifically the cattle raid of Cooley. Celtic cultures were spread throughout Northern Europe, at least until the end of the Roman Empire. Roman legions abandoned the province of Britain in the middle of the 5th century CE. This means that Mediterranean learning was introduced to places like Ireland, which were subsequently isolated during the Dark Ages. The Irish monks followed their own rules and developed their own scholarly culture and monasticism. The creation of the Free Irish State in 1922 marked the creation of the first post-medieval Celtic nation in the world. In regards to the gods and literatures of the ancient Celts, most of our evidence comes from Roman classical commentators. This is known as Interpretatio Romana and is of course highly biased. Most informative for the gods of the Celts is the Stoic philosopher Posidonius. He spoke of Celtic bardic institutions and the champion's portion, that is a ceremony at banquets which awarded the choicest portion of pork to the most exalted hero. Caesar described the Celtic pantheon in terms of Roman equivalents. Remember Plutarch on the Egyptian gods? Ireland as a real geographical place was not established until the geography of Ptolemy in the 2nd century CE although there were many manuscripts in existence in Celtic languages from 600 to 1600 CE, knowledge of Old Irish was lost in modern times. This is why the Welsh Mabinogion was translated earlier than the oldest Irish narratives. Translation of Old Irish could not begin until the language was deciphered in the mid 19th century by German philologists. Once texts became more widely available, readers noted the parallels between Celtic and classical heroes. The hero Cuchulain was dubbed the Irish Hercules. Matthew Arnold believed the Celts had plundered Greco-Roman myth. It took many years before it became possible to speak of a coherent Celtic mythology. This is because Celtic gods appear only marginally in the surviving texts, which tend to focus on heroes and other great personages with divine attributes. The Celtic narratives are more literature, legend, and saga than cosmogonic myth. In fact, we don't know what the ancient Celtic cosmogonic or anthropogonic myth entailed, although there are some pretty fascinating and well-researched reconstructions in various books on the Celtic gods, such as Ireland's Immortals, A History of the Gods in Irish Myth by Mark Williams, which I would uh, recommend most highly, and the earlier, very influential, The Gods of the Celts by Miranda Green, which my um, Irish archaeologist aunt actually gave me for a birthday present when I was quite young. In the actual Irish sources, we have mythical figures like St. Patrick appear frequently. Many figures in Irish myth also seem to have connection to earlier ancient deities, such as the Irish Luke Lamhofta, the son of the god Lugos. If any of you have watched season one of the TV series Britannia, you'll know who Lugos is. Archaeological evidence at Newgrain and Gavernus suggests sun worship and sun discs as symbols of healing and fertility. St. Patrick mentions this when he compares the worship of the sun unfavorably to the worship of Christ. 
The Irish hero Luke Lampota has solar connections, Luke meaning light or brightness. Whether there was a Celtic sun god is unclear. There is more evidence for a Celtic god of the sky, Tyrannus, thunderer associated with Jupiter or Indra or Dispater in earlier Indo-European dialects. Celtic deities are often associated with particular places, such as Shi or fairy mounds, and might be associated with local or national deities. For example, Bruna Boine is a local residence of Agnes Og, the god of poetry. The Celts had a highly spiritual view of the physical world. Nature is numinous and animistic, and so places associated with local deities or fairies and spirit folk are countless. Caves, waterfalls, fords, conspicuous hills, rivers, mounds, wells, springs. Mythical places such as Conla's Well exist in the land of Tir Nanog, the land of youth. At real-world places such as the falls of Asaro, the hero Fionn Makui Grant gains wisdom by touching the salmon with his thumb and tasting it. In County Kerry, there are two hills known as the Paps of Anna. The name Danu Anna is the patron goddess and protectress of the Tuatha de Danann, the earliest Celtic tribe in Ireland, who probably arrived around 350 BCE. We don't know who lived in Ireland previously to the Celtic invasions, but we know they created the great barrows and carved tumuli, still visible all over Ireland. Here is a contemporary rendition of the land of Tir Nanog. In Southern Ireland, we hear of the goddess Mor Mumam, who was so beautiful that every woman in Ireland was compared to her. Medieval scribes assign her extraordinary qualities, frenzy, exultation, enchantment, hearing voices, flying, wandering in rages for years, and sexual intimacy with heroes. We also hear of the three sisters, Pola, Bamba, and Eru, who are important in helping the Tuatha de Dana fight off Malaysian invaders in Western Ireland. There are many Celtic water deities. An interesting one dates from the 3rd century BCE, Glanis, goddess of the sacred springs in Glanum, which is in Provence in southern France, and who was a goddess associated with healing. Celts of early Brittany had their own goddesses, Brigantia, Coventina, and Sulis. Animals also figure prominently in Celtic myth. Early Celtic art shows a preference for water birds. For example, a cormorant drawing a sun chariot or ducks beside a solar wheel. Long-legged waddling birds, such as the egret or crane, are often paired with bulls. There was a prohibition against eating crane meat, since many human beings transformed into cranes, according to Irish myth. Jason's golden fleece is comparable in Irish myth to the crane bag. Commentators think the crane bag is part of an origin of language and poetry myth. Apparently, Irish poets had samurai-like moves called glam decent or poet's execration. This involved standing on one leg like a crane, with one eye closed and one arm extended, the open eye fixed on an enemy. A victim of Glam Deeson might have his face blistered or lose his life. It seems to be sort of like a karate kid move. There is also a Celtic horse goddess, Epona, who was a side saddle riding nymph. Where druids do appear in Celtic history and myth, they can be understood as priests, poets, philosophers, magicians, sages, a member of the Vedic Rishi, and were a religious order among several but not all Celtic peoples. They officiated over sacrifice, exercised legal and juridical authority, and were the privileged learned class. There were three ranks or classes of druids in ancient times known to Caesar. One, the philosophers or theologians, two, the diviners or seers, and three, the poets or bardi, Irish filid, Latin vates. Both women and men seem to have served as druids, and some women druids were also fierce warrior generals, a fact very shocking to Roman occupiers. The oldest reference to druids come from an anonymous Greek source from 200 BCE, which speaks of philosophers among the Celtic barbarians. Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars and Posidonius both speak of Druids. Caesar viewed them as a religious class alongside the nobles or equites. He described the Druids as a highly organized intertribal brotherhood with complex rites of succession and beliefs in reincarnation or metempsychosis. Druids have been compared to the Roman Flamines and to the Brahmins of India, which we studied. While it was influential for Fraser's The Golden Bow, scholars now reject the etymology of the word druid from dervo vidos, knowledge of the oak. Latin Greek druidae goes back to the Gaulish roots druvis. We don't know what it meant. Old Irish dri can mean wizard, diviner, poet, or learned man. 
Gaulish Druids means wise man of the woods or very wise man. The 1973 British cult movie The Wicker Man, watched by the founders of Burning Man Festival, of course, involves burning a man alive within a wicker figure of a man. Druidism was outlawed by the Romans and ended in Roman Britain in 61 CE when Roman soldiers massacred many Druids. Not very historically accurate, super fun, you can watch the TV series Britannia, which is loosely modeled on these events. Druidism may not simply have been snuffed out with the coming of Christianity, but there is no evidence that it wasn't. For true believers, Druidic faith has survived in secret through the centuries, but it wasn't until the 1600s that modern Druidism came into being, and the Order of the Druids was founded in 1717. So a bit more about the ancient Celtic gods. Of 374 deities named in ancient inscriptions and records, 305 occur only once, so our resources here are scant. Caesar speaks of six major Gaulish gods ranked in this order. Above all, Mercury or Lugo, a crafty god sometimes depicted as triple-faced or triple-phallist and associated with hunting. A Gaulish Apollo, named Belenus, associated with the sun and healing, as well as with the Beltane festival or May Day celebrations. A Gaulish Jupiter, the Celtic being Taranis, a bloody war god, a Gaulish Minerva, sometimes Sulis or Morigna or Brigantia Bridget, a triple healing goddess, the Gaulish Mars, the Artutates, the god of the tribe, also a war god as well as a protector, and a Gaulish Dispater or Hades or Pluto. We don't know if this was in fact a separate Celtic god, as some evidence suggests he was identified with Taranis or Teutones. Not mentioned by Caesar, there may have been a Gaulish Vulcan or smithy god in terms of the time depth for the remnants of Celtic mythology that we have. It seems that by the 4th century BCE, Ireland was colonized by Iberian Celts, and it is from the British Celts who were pushed into Wales that the legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table would spring, which we'll cover next week. After the fall of the Roman Empire and coming of Christianity and monasticism, surviving Celtic peoples established their own written traditions, first in Ireland and later in Wales. This makes dating most myths that have survived very difficult. American's poem, pronounced as he stepped off the boat that brought him to Irish shores, is thought to be the earliest poem we have in archaic Irish. I've included uh, Lady Gregory's translation of American's song, which you can find in this treasury of Irish myth, legend, and folklore, which contains fairy and folk tales of the Irish peasantry by W.B. Yeats, as well as sources uh, translated by Mary Gregory.
maverick theorist, poet, and translator Robert Graves builds an entire interpretation of the Celtic bardic or poetic traditions out of this absolutely gorgeous hymn in his book The White Goddess, a historical grammar of poetic myth, arguing that English poetic education should really begin not with Canterbury's tales or the Odyssey, not even Genesis, but with the Song of Amergen, an ancient Celtic calendar alphabet found in several purposely garbled Irish and Welsh variants, which briefly summarizes the prime poetic myth of these traditions. Graves as well provides us with a reconstructed translation and version. I am a stag of seven tines. I am a flood across a plain. I am a wind on a deep lake. I am a tear that the sun lets fall. I am a hawk above a cliff. I am a thorn beneath a nail. I am a wonder among the flowers. I am a wizard. Who but I sets the cool head aflame with smoke? And so on. It seems that becoming part of the bardic or poetic class in Ireland for centuries involved close memorization and performance of this poem in particular. So that concludes our brief summary of the history of Celtic culture and mythology, or at least what is known of it, prior to the major cycles of myths that have survived, such as the cattle raid of Cooley. At this point, we're transitioning to Thomas Gehill's reading in How the Irish Saved Civilization. Bill begins by remarking that we don't really know how old a Merkin's astonishing poem is. It is not as old as the Celtic invasion, but not as young as our earliest source in the 12th century CE. Similar remarks apply to dating the most famous of all Irish legendary poems, the Tain, in translation, The Cattle Raid of Cooley. Cahill believes the event set down here occurred as early as the first century CE. Irish culture at that time was a, quote, illiterate, aristocratic, semi-nomadic, Iron Age warrior culture, its wealth based on animal husbandry and slavery, both institutions being underlined in the Tain's royal inventory. Cahill reads the Tain as a core document in seeking to understand a timeless Ireland, the culture that the Celts founded in Ireland, still untouched by Roman influence. The narrative of the Tain reads like something in Homer, or ancient India, or Mesopotamia. It is full of war horses and chariots, and common standards of heroic action. The opening scene of the cattle raid of Cooley is set in northwest Ireland, in a fortified dwelling or rath, round, light, two-storied, wooden-pillared house with a maze of rooms and at its center, a royal hall and a bedroom, guarded by screens of copper with bars of silver and gold birds on the screen and precious jewels. Fascinatingly, the oldest Irish myth we have begins with a pillow talk scene. Queen Med and King Eilil are lying in bed talking about how happy they are. The king, of course, tries to take all the credit. It struck me how much better you are off today than the day I married you. Amazingly, this little sentence ends up sowing marital discord and even war. Queen Med is obviously not the type of woman to accept the patriarchal idea of a husband-man king as a provider, nurturer, breadwinner, and owner-manager of the kingdom. Eilid's diminishing of Med's material contributions to the marriage goes as far as saying that all her wealth amounts to little more than woman's things with a little loot and plunder mixed in. Med, the highest and haughtiest according to the Tain, has heard enough and gives her husband a tour de force of her illustrious genealogy, adding, I outdid them in grace and giving and battle and warlike combat. I had 1,500 soldiers in my royal pay, all exile sons, the same number of freeborn native men, and that was only our ordinary household. Things get heated in more ways than one. Med goes on to assert her rightful sovereignty over the whole province of Ireland and how many great kings she refused to wed. Quote, For I asked a harder wedding gift than any woman ever asked before from a man in Ireland, the absence of meanness and jealousy and fear. Cahill notes that this gift from a potential husband qualifies him as a worthy mate for this particular queen, someone in possession of the three core Celtic virtues. Med is handsome or beautiful, Med is giving or generous, and Med is brave. She should expect no less from a potential partner and co-ruler. Handsome and jealous are not exactly opposites, Cahill notes, but they are related since a wife's extreme beauty inevitably provokes intense insecurity from most any husband. In Med's case, the absence of jealousy required seems more related to loyalty, 
and less to a strict sexual fidelity. Med is in fact a sexually liberated woman who, a bit later in the Tain, offers her quote, friendly thighs to a neighboring king. At this point in the pillow talk, Med goes on to inventory all the astonishing material wealth she brought to the marriage and even concludes, so if anyone causes you shame or upset or trouble, the right to compensation is mine for you are a kept man. Idil responds that he only came to marry Med to protect and manage a province which was run by a woman. This is obviously a stalemate of sorts and an end to marital harmony. Med challenges Eilil to a full accounting of their respective holdings which they brought into the marriage. The pillow talk bedroom scene ends as they jump up that very moment to start counting all that they own. Just think how amazing this is, a whole myth about a marital dispute and taking clear accounts of what belongs to whom down to the smallest detail so that either the female or the male dominance of the kingdom can be established. The inventory they produce is instructive about the society they lived in, especially in regards to the things that are most valued and considered as currency standards. For example, bondsmaids, i.e. slave girls, are discussed by them as virtually the gold standard. Most valued of all, however, are the finest breeding animals. The inventory competition comes to a standstill when Eilil takes the lead in net worth, for he has a breeding bull, Finn Benak, the white horned, which tips the balance. This bull is the calf of one of Med's cows, so it's kind of cheating for Eilil to claim it as his own, no? Apparently, the bull went over to Eilil's herd of his own free will because of his strenuous objections to female rule. Here we have a myth where a gender-conscious bull decides the political fate of a country. Med couldn't find in her herd the equal of the bull, so her spirits dropped as though she hadn't a single penny calls for her ch chief messenger, McRoth, to find the match of Eilid's bull, actually her bull, if she had chosen to override the conscious decision of the bull. She is told of the brown bull of Kulang and promptly sends a most enticing offer to its king. In payment for a one-year loan of the bull, she offers by messenger 50 heifers, plenty of land, a chariot worth 21 slave girls, and my own friendly thighs on top of that. Cahill comments that this must have been a rough, strange, and simple world, full of barbaric splendor. There is no deliberation, subtlety, refinement, or ambiguity. These characters are not deep thinkers, but rather great actors. They act with a characteristic panache and roundedness that easily convinces us of their humanity. Another example of this is how McRoth's messenger party botches the agreement with the King of Kulain. He agrees to the deal, but rescinds his agreement, and Med's men boast that they would have taken the bull anyway, with or without his leave. Talk about an honor complex. Med goes to war. These characters have no idea about the fine art of negotiation. The second king literally refuses the best deal of his life, including Med's friendly thighs, on the basis of a servant's post. And Med goes to war without any care for a diplomatic resolution. Cahill comments, the sexual frankness of these characters is unlike anything in classical literature, even the folk epics of Homer. We would need to reach all the way back to the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh to find anything comparable. Yep, that's an Enkidu Shamat reference that you got. Importantly, Med's offer of her friendly thighs is the opposite of a needed gesture. She includes the detail casually from a position of supreme sovereignty. It does not even seem designed to arouse her husband's jealousy although a small slight to her husband may be implied. Cahill notes, in early Irish literature, both men and women openly admire one another's physical endowments and invite one another to bed without formality. Not even the troubadour poetry of medieval Occitanian cultures are so bold. Foretelling the rest of Med's story, Cahill pivots to adultery in the Deidre myth, in which Deidre goes for a spontaneous romp in the fields with Nosiu, a young bull, whom she chooses as preferable to the great bull, her king. In the Tain cycle, there is a similar scene between the hero Cuchulain, the Irish Achilles, and Emer, the girl he comes to woo. In the context of a perfectly chivalrous greeting, Cuchulain peers down her dress, I see a sweet country, I could rest my weapon there. Importantly, the hero Cuchulain sets for himself the heroic agenda he must accomplish before releasing the power of Emer as bride. This is very different than continental heroic myth in which it is almost always a dispatcher king who determines the itinerary of the hero's journey. 
for the Irish Cuchulain, it is none other than himself. The deeds required by Cuchulain involve killing a hundred men at every ford, doing the salmon leap while carrying twice his weight in gold, striking down three groups of men with a single stroke while leaving the middlemen in each group unharmed, going without sleep from Samhain or Halloween until Imbolc or the first day of spring, and then after one night of sleep, going without sleep from Imbolc to Beltane. This means one night of sleep in six months. Gehill comments, these people certainly are confident. It is easy to imagine them riding hard on horseback, drawing the blood of their enemies, leaping about in muscular dancing, and passing the damp Irish night in vigorous coupling. G.K. Chesterton remarks, for the great gales of Ireland are the men that God made mad, for all their wards are merry and all their songs are sad. A Google image search for Emer slightly misreads Cuchulain's hero's journey in terms of what Emer demands. That is all well and good as a feminist reappropriation. Gehill includes this image of the dying Gaul from the Roman copy of a Greek statue as the epitome of the Celtic warrior's bravery, and goes on to a discussion of the famous phenomena of warp spasm in Celtic heroic myth. Remarking, the Romans in their first encounter with these exposed insane warriors were shocked and frightened. Not only were these men naked, they were howling and it seemed possessed by demons. So outrageous was their strength and verve. Urged on by the infernal skirl of pipers, they presented to the unaccustomed and throbbing Roman sensorium a multimedia event featuring all the terrors of hell itself. The Irish heroes themselves called this phenomena warp spasm. Here you see a depiction of Cuchulain's warp spasm in the background. You can read for yourself Cahill's three quotes on the warp spasm of Cuchulain. There are some great battle scenes in Greek and Roman myth, but none of these are even remotely comparable to the graphic, both intimate and interior descriptions of Cuchulain's warp spasm in the Tame. This is comic book hero stuff to a T and surpasses even what CGI Hollywood has attempted. And it would be neat to see a feature film attempting to meet the warp spasm description that we find in the Tame. There's much more of interest in this chapter, especially the poetic passages having to do with the Deirdre myth. Cahill's overall view on the ancient Irish mythic ethos is as follows. Fixity escaped these people, as in the end it escapes us all. They understood, as few have understood before or since, how fleeting life is, and how pointless to try to hold on to things or people. They pursued the wondrous deed, the heroic gesture, fighting, fucking, drinking, art, poetry for intense emotion, the music that accompanied heroic drinking, with which each day ended, bewitching ornament for one's persons and possessions. All these are worth pursuit, and are the honor which great souls seek. For Cahill, the ancient Irish lived fast and hard, wonderful songs and thrilling stories. What they lacked was personal peace and social harmony, not just fidelity, but loyalty. Only a Christian mythos, St. Patrick, established in his reading A Holy Ireland. Turning back round to the conclusion of the story of Med, Cahill points out just how rare a female queen protagonist is in the world of literature and myth. The conclusion of the Tain, an ostensible moral uttered by a vaguely omniscient Fergus, we followed the rump of a misguiding woman. It is the usual thing for a herd led by a mare to be strayed and destroyed. Med does not reappear after this judgment on her, but even this last word seems overshadowed by her personality. Women continue to figure prominently in Celtic and Irish myth. Med is not an exception. Cuchulain is trained in battlecraft, for example, by three women, three goddesses of war. Moving on now from Cahill to MacKillop, we can note that Irish mythology is full of sovereignty goddesses and fecundator kings. Med is strong-willed, ambitious, cunning, and promiscuous, the archetype of the warrior queen. Although a mortal, Med fits the archetypal pattern for Irish sovereignty goddesses in general. Irish myth has many sovereignty goddesses more than many other cultures. Her namesake is the name of an actual goddess in Irish lore, Med Lethgurg the sovereignty goddess who ruled at Terra. In a way, everyone already knows this goddess because she is the inspiration through the spelling Maeve behind Shakespeare's Queen Mab in Romeo and Juliet. Her name is thought to derive from Indo-European Medu, Mead, or Medua, intoxicating, or Medua, ruler. And so she has been interpreted as a Mead goddess who intoxicates and rules. She often appears as a fair-haired wolf queen who inspires awe as well as terror. 
So let's now examine the institutions of sacred kingship as well and the union kings undergo with various sovereignty goddesses in Irish myth. These kings can be called fecundators because it is their union with the goddess that ensures peace, prosperity, and fertility. Ireland had many kings, chieftains, re or Latin rex, so the claim that many Irish people are descended from royalty is not unfounded. In fact, we know the names of more than 12,000 persons who lived in Ireland before 1100 CE. That's many more than the Anglo-Saxon or Germanic written records. The initiation of kings involved a profound and mysterious ritual that signaled spiritual and physical intimacy with sovereignty represented by a sovereignty goddess. Since the Romans never conquered Ireland, they retained their own laws until the Anglo-Norman conquest of the 12th century. Brehan laws did not practice primogeniture inheritance by the eldest son, but election to kingship by the most qualified derbethien or kin descended from a common great ancestor. Even sons of concubines or adulterous liaisons could be considered for kingship. This institution is also depicted in Scottish Gaelic cultures in the popular show Outlanders. Irish kings had to be elected, tested, and to possess requisite qualities, such as righteousness, beyond reproach, to Mizil's sacred function, that they are descended from high ancestry, capable of heroic deeds, the noble or martial function, and are capable of ensuring peace, prosperity, and bounty, which is the social harmony or agricultural fertility function. The 1936 film Gone with the Wind put the word terra into common vocabulary. It is there today, a hill of about 507 feet in northwest Ireland near County Meath, from which you can see one-third of all of Ireland. Terra was once an important kingdom and is one of the most major archaeological sites in Ireland. My aunt Niamh O'Kelly Whitfield is actually a foremost expert on the jewellery found at Terra, especially the Terra brooch. Kings at Terra would be initiated through coming into contact with the Stone of Destiny, or Lia Fael, Ireland was called Innisfail, the Island of Destiny. The phallic stone is reputed in legend to have cried out at the touch of the true king, kind of like Arthur pulling the sword from the stone. Terra is sacred to the goddess Med and was a burial site as early as the 3rd millennia BCE and seems to have been a major center for the creation and dissemination of much of Irish legend and myth. It continues today as a site of political demonstration and rebellion and there on the right, you can see the famous Lia Fail, or Stone of Destiny, as it stands in Terra today. Celtic jewelry is truly astonishing. More like the work of fairies than of human beings, here you see the Terra brooch, a masterpiece of late Celtic metalwork, and the subject of my aunt's doctoral dissertation. Celtic Christianity was also very different than Roman Catholic Christianity. A Welsh cleric gives a horrified description of kingly initiation in the Northwest, Donegal, based on rumor rather than observation and probably greatly exaggerated. In his account, the establishing of the new king involved sexual intercourse with a white mare, professions of bestiality, followed by sacrifice of the mare, and the new king bathing with the cut-up carcass in a bath, all the while drinking the bath water and eating the fleshy chunks. Once completed, he is the new king. It is thought by Irish scholars that there may have been some pretty weird by our standards kingly initiation rites, but that this account is grossly exaggerated. Inauguration of a king in Irish myth and legend is so frequently associated with sexual metaphors and rituals that it is likely some sexual rites were practiced in the context of libation or a ceremonial drink offered by the bride and sexual intercourse with the new king and the abstract idea of the sovereignty of Ireland. In Irish myth, kingship is male and sovereignty is female. The Indo-European idea of the king's legitimacy and authority deriving from hierogamy with a goddess of sovereignty has appeared many times in the myth of Neolithic and early civilizations and also in India. There are many depictions of sovereignty goddesses in ancient Ireland, most frequently as the frightful demanding crone or loathly lady who turns into a young beauty of promiscuous appetite when kissed and then confers a kingdom. In earlier traditions, such as the Tain, the sovereignty goddess is primary and the king a timid second. In later traditions, the king has primacy that the sovereignty goddess can disrupt. 
Banba, Fodla, and Eru are the three most frequently cited sovereignty goddesses. They first appear in the Lebor Kabbalah or Book of Invasions during the time of the Milesian invaders in the land of the Tuatha de Dana. At first, all three opposed the invaders, but then changed their minds and integrated them into the sovereignty of Ireland. All three demand favor in exchange for their support and request that Ireland be named after them. All three also become tutelary protectress goddesses in alliance with sacred kings. All three are successful, but only Eru ends up being the name of Ireland in the modern period. Here you see artistic depictions of the sovereignty goddess Eru, modern day Ireland. There are also other sovereignty goddesses such as Flathius. In her story, four brothers go hunting and stop in the forest to cook a meal. A horrible hag, black as coal, with horse hair and pustules, approaches them looking for a kiss. Three brothers refuse, but Niel agrees even to lie with her and then gives her a passionate kiss. At this, she turns into a gorgeous woman, clad in royal purple, and founds the Udniel dynasty. The boom in Celtic studies of the 20th century coincided with the rise of academic feminism. Since ancient Irish myth and legend contained many strong female protagonists, and since Irish law or Brehon law conferred more rights on women than any European country, Irish culture has often been held up, perhaps a little too fervently, as a feminist utopia in comparison to others. In very early Roman accounts, Celtic women assumed roles denied to them in neighboring societies, such as a female religious official, druids, or great warriors. Brehon law allowed for many forms of marriage, most prominently marriages where the husband has more wealth, where the wealth is equal, or the wife has more wealth. In Irish marital law, such wealth remained personal property during the marriage and could be reclaimed after a divorce. This accounts for the setup, as we learned before, of the myth of Queen Med and Eileen. It's the working out of a subtle legal point. Women could marry by eloping, they could initiate divorce for violence, adultery, impotency, homosexuality, and sexual harassment was punished. Things were far from perfect, however, a newly married husband could bring home a concubine, and both the wife and the concubine were protected legally from any harm inflicted on each other during the first three days of marriage, that is any harm short of murder. Shilena gigs are also a famous aspect of Irish iconography and myth. These are stone carvings from medieval Ireland, Wales, and Scotland that depict a naked woman smiling grotesquely, her legs spread apart, and her hands stroking her genitals. There are more than 144 examples of Sheila na gigs in ancient Irish and medieval Irish churches. Their interpretation is still contentious. Are they depictions of the sin of lust or remnants of fertility symbols from Celtic spirituality now within Irish Christianity? Feminist commentators have asserted that they are the primal earth mother symbol from the goddess cults that predate Christianity. And the final figure we're going to look at in our brief survey of Celtic myth is St. Bridget, or Bridget of Kildare. She is the best known of the female Irish saints and contemporaneous with St. Patrick's missionizing of Ireland. Daughter of a slave girl, she was nevertheless well-educated and refused marriage since she had vowed her virginity to God. She took the veil and became the first Irish nun. Conventionally known as the Mary of the Gales, her feast day is February 1st. Interestingly, earlier forms of Bridget portray her as a tutelary goddess, her name may go back to the English Brigantia and the Gaulish Brigando. The Vatican still recognizes her as a saint. She is described as a radiant beauty, never in want of suitors, and the founder of a flourishing monastic community. In contemporary magical traditions, she is worshipped as a fire goddess, or goddess of the inextinguishable spiritual fire, and thus related both to the destiny of Ireland and to its Indo-European origins in the goddess Hestia, or the Vedic Agni. Okay, there's always so much more to cover when it comes to Irish and Celtic myth and legend, but this has already gone on a bit long, so that suffices for our brief overview. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your lecture this week, and I'll see you next week to discuss the Arthurian sagas.